Well, I get this pulled up. I, I did want to thank everybody for, for joining. Um, as Maria mentioned, I work for DHEC as a public health physician. Before I came to DHEC, I actually did a pediatric residency. So in addition to doing public health and preventive medicine, my background's in pediatrics. So I, I come from that background and um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of vaccines in general and their ability to prevent disease, um, both for my patients and for my own kids. So um, that's, that's my background when I come to this talk, just so you know where I'm, it's not gonna, probably not a big surprise um, what, where I'm coming from, but um, I did wanna go through kind of what's going on with COVID with you all this evening and kind of how I wanted to, or how I would think through the questions I think parents have been asking me over the last months. Um, so I want to help you think through, you know, for your 12 to 17 year old or whatever age they are, um, what, what questions do you have and how do you think through it? Um, so I, I look at it, I kind of think of myself as like the, uh, the nerdy accountant of medicine or you know, like the tax preparer. Like I look at the numbers and crunch numbers and try and figure out, does this make sense? So you look at the, how bad is the disease, um, look at the vaccines, how good is it? And then you have to do a risk benefit analysis and weigh the pros with the cons essentially and make sure that you know, the numbers make sense. Uh, on a population level. So I'm going to present you with some numbers this evening. So hopefully that will get at some of your questions, but I also want it to be uh, interactive and answer questions that you might have. So um, stick with me, hopefully, if your eyes don't glaze over too quickly. So this is what I think, um, as a parent, this is what people ask themselves. Should I vaccinate my middle schooler or high schooler against COVID-19? Now, I, as 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 a, if I'm wearing a pediatrician hat, I help you answer that question. Should you vaccinate your student? Uh, yes or no, and we'll walk through that. As a public health professional, I think on a bigger level, bigger picture, should adolescents be vaccinated against COVID-19? Should South Carolinian adolescents get the COVID-19 vaccine? So I ask a similar question, but I look at it a little bit differently. So how bad is COVID-19 for, we're looking at it for South Carolina and for youth, and by youth, I have the data for 11 to 20 year olds. So for South Carolina, we're approaching 600,000 cases, over 23,600 hospitalizations, and the it's the third leading cause of death last year, 2020, it was 9,846 deaths currently. Um, it was over 9,000 um, for the calendar year last year. I don't know the exact number, but the top two leading causes were heart disease and cancer, and they're around 10,000. So, I mean, this far surpassed homicides, suicides, car accidents, motor vehicle accidents combined. So it was a big cause of death. Um, and there were 580 deaths in Richland County alone. So a substantial contribution uh, in your county as well. If I look at the adolescent population, we've had a little over 81,000 cases, 268 kids were hospitalized. The, the MISC or the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, there've been 121 documented cases and that ranges from kids zero to 19. And there have been nine deaths in the pediatric population in South Carolina. And I know these numbers, you know, we, I, I said I kind of wear the accountant hat of medicine in some ways, or the kind of the nerdy numbers, but we also really recognize that there are people behind these numbers. And there are people within DHEC who have lost their loved ones, they've lost their grandparents, um, friends, um, pastors. Um, so I know that, you know, these numbers sometimes seem kind of cold or distant, but, you know, I, I we, we, and we can't say a lot in the news. So, you know, all we can really say is that there was a teen who died or there's a child who died um, under the age of five, you know, and we recognize that that, you know, I, I think about my own kids, that's, it's just life altering, you know, it's just, it just shatters your world when you lose, lose a child. So I know for as many numbers as we hear thrown out in the news day in and day out around COVID, these are very real um, people. And each, you know, each of the stories you hear about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm South Carolina mom who delivered her, her 10th child. And then, you know, a week or two later, she died after, you know, she had COVID at the time. So all those are heartbreaking. So our, I mean, my goal in medicine is to keep people healthy and well and to prevent, you know, death. So when it comes to vaccines, to me, it's like, this is the best way to prevent these things from happening. So when I hear people say, oh, it's just like the flu, it's not that bad. My, I said, okay, well then let, let's look at that. Let's, is it really like the flu? Is it, how does it compare? So we can go back and look at what our usual flu season like, is like. So you see the first two kind of um, waves or spikes of waves. That's the 2018, 2019 number of cases of flu. 
uh, and the second one's 2019, 2020. And then you see this noticeable gap where there's nothing in 2020, 2021. So this last year, there have been essentially no flu cases. Um, it's, it's essentially absent. And uh, to me, I think this really underscores the point that uh, our public health measures of physical distancing and face masks really worked because we had a really negligible flu season. Um, and it wasn't because the people got vaccinated either. I had some reporters asking me about that. Well, didn't people, more people get vaccinated? And as much as we put the message out there, we had about a 10% decline in the number of people that got flu vaccines, and yet you still have this huge drop. So, um, Dr. Kameka, if yeah. you may be getting to this, we do have a question asking how the COVID death numbers compared to death numbers from flu. I'll get on the next slide. Okay. Just want to make sure. So this is the hospitalizations from flu. So um, this, I'm going to kind of walk through it a little bit here. All the way on the left column is the overall number of hospitalizations. And this is um, looked at for the current calendar year, comparing it to the previous year. So this week, there were two hospitalizations. And they were in the people that were 50 to 64 and one person that was over 65. Um, but if you look at it overall for the 2020-21 year, uh, flu year, there had been 165 hospitalizations. Uh, two of them were in kids zero to four. Um, and then you can kind of go all the way down at the bottom uh, as the five year season average. So you can look at all five seasons average them together and say, okay, at this time for this week of July, normally we've had, we'd have about 2,900 hospitalizations related to flu. And this year we've had 165. So that's what it looks like overall. And you can kind of see the age, the age breakdown. So if we're talking about kids five to 17, normally there'd be 135 on average uh, at this point in the year, and we've had none. So these are, this is the question about how many deaths there have been. Uh, so overall there have been 18 deaths and they've been mostly in older folks over 65, uh, but I think last year we had around 140, but at this point last year there were 138. Uh, and any average, or in the last five years, average year we've had, we have about 134 deaths. So, you know, again, most of the time kids do well, but you can see again, if you look at age zero to four and five to 17, there usually are a couple of deaths that happen on average in a year. And obviously we haven't had any deaths this year. So, you know, how bad is it compared to flu? You know, I would say we've had definitely um, more deaths compared to what, what flu would cause for the pediatric population, never mind the adult population. The adult population, there's no question. Um, and this kind of gives a comparison as well, looking at the hospitalization rate. Uh, this is something the CDC published earlier uh, to look at the cumulative rate of COVID-19 hospitalizations comparing with flu hospitalizations for the 12 to 17 age group over the last four years. So you see the dotted lines uh, at the bottom are the last few flu years. Noticeably, it doesn't include this current flu year, the 2020-21 flu year, because it's, like I said, almost negligible. But if you kind of take an average year, the, the rates of hospitalization for COVID-19 are, are much higher than for flu. Okay, so um, next question that I think is a, a, a reasonable one people have when they're watching the news, is it COVID-19 essentially over in South Carolina? The numbers are way down. So let's take a, let's break it down a little bit. Um, so yes, our numbers are definitely going down. This is this most of these slides are available are available. This data is available on, on the internet, but I, this particular one is coming from our DHEC website. So the uh, green line is fitting a seven day average to the kind of the daily number. So it kind of smooths out the trends a little bit. So you can definitely see there's been a downward uh, trajectory since we had our you know big spike in the winter. So we're moving down. There's been even little blips here and there. Um, the tail end is, is flattening, um, though it might be coming up a little bit. I, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, again, the number of deaths are also going down by, this is the number of deaths by week. So, I mean, you see there was a 520 deaths in one week, which is just an astronomical amount. I mean, it, that, I think that particular week, week, it was the leading cause of, you know, it was the leading cause of death above, you know, cancers and heart disease and things like that. So there's definitely a stretch where it was pretty, pretty bleak. Um, so this is, this other way to look at it is looking at the percent uh, of tests that we do that are positive. So sometimes if you just look at the total number of people that are positive, you could say, well, the number could go really down because you're not testing people that much, right? If you test a thousand people versus if you test a hundred people, you can get a very different number of people that are positive. So the other way that we 
look at that is to look at the percent of people that were positive with the test that performed because that kind of normalizes the population, then, right? So we were trending down. We were uh, at around 2% uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we've been kind of going up. We've had some percents over 5% that are coming back positive. And so right now, I think our seven day average is approaching 4%. Um, and you know, we do have some concern about trends that we're seeing in the, in the US as well about the Delta variant kind of taking hold and being more transmissible and numbers going up. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, I'm not sure where it's gonna go in South Carolina. I wouldn't be surprised if our numbers continue to go up. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. Uh, I don't think it would shock a lot of people in public health. So we'll have to kind of see if there's a 4th of July effect, more people getting together that we might see a little bit more of a bump, but um, time will tell. So the other uh, thing I think is worth considering when we say, well, the numbers are going down, that's true, 100% true. Uh, but I would ask then, well, who's getting COVID now? If the numbers are going down, is it still you know, equally distributed in a setting where people are getting vaccinated? And there's a pretty clear um, answer to that. We, we went back and looked at the people who got COVID the first two weeks of June. We had you know, good data to be able to analyze that, um, that, that particular group where we felt confident in our analysis of looking at their vaccine status. So the 1,600 people that, we, that had COVID that were new, newly diagnosed and for which we had their vaccine status, 94% of them weren't fully vaccinated. Of the 92 cases that were hospitalized, we knew their vaccine status, about 90% were not fully vaccinated. And all 11 people who died were not fully vaccinated. So yes, our numbers are going down, but the people who are getting COVID now are the ones who aren't vaccinated. And so that um, obviously there are adults that aren't vaccinated, but now you know we have a whole nother population that's eligible in the 12 to 17 year old group that you know could be protected if, if we vaccinate them. So I think that this really underscores the point that yes, numbers are going down, but if you're not vaccinated, it doesn't matter for you. Um, you're you're still at risk. So then the question is, well, how good <clears throat> are the vaccines at protecting people? They're very good. Um, the BioNTech is the one that we're most concerned about right now, obviously, in this conversation tonight, because that's the one where um, adolescents are eligible for vaccine. And most um, studies kind of show 90 to 95% efficacy at preventing infection. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, Moderna is around the same. Janssen is pretty comparable. Um, they were doing their studies looking at a slightly different population. But if you're talking about, you know, preventing severe disease or death, they're all um, on par with achieving that goal. I, I wouldn't put one ahead of the other. So there are some <clears throat> advantages to some over the others, but um, obviously the one that we're concerned about tonight is the Pfizer BioNTech for the pediatric population that's currently eligible. But now the real concern that people have every time when these variants come up is, well, <clears throat> are, the, are the vaccines any good against them? Or we, should we wait for a different vaccine to come out? What, when that needs to be tweaked or adjusted? And, you know, how many times are we gonna have to get vaccinated? Uh, Right now, it's still just two doses of vaccine. And if we can all do our job and get vaccinated and, and prevent the variants from circulating, hopefully not on wood, it would stay at two, but time will tell. If we look at what's, um, what's circulating, it's, it's shifted um, as far as the variants go. So, you know, essentially 95, 97% of everything that was really circulating is a variant in, in the US. There really isn't this wild type anymore. It's all a variant. There was a long period of time where it was the alpha variant or the UK variant that was a predominant strain. And over the last month, that's really shifted where the Delta variant has now become the predominant uh, variant in the United States. So it's essentially out competing the other ones. It's more transmissible. It, it, it infects people better and, and more quickly than the alpha. So it's kind of out competing the alpha variant. Um, and this kind of gives you a look at that regionally. Um, so again, the darker orange is the Delta variant, and that kind of lighter tan is the UK variant. So if you look all the way, let's say out west, and by the number nine, you can see that that area has much more of the um, Delta variant. So it is region seven, eight, or region four. It's right now a, a, about a, a even split <clears throat> between the Delta variant and the UK variant, but that's just a matter of time because the Delta is just better at transmitting. It's just a, a better equipped, better mutated virus. So it's coming. Um, it's more transmissible than the alpha variant. Um, some studies say it's somewhere between 40 and 60% more transmissible. I read uh, work by an epidemiologist today that said it's 200% more transmissible than the wild type. 
um, which makes sense to me because you know people heard about the UK variant. It was oh man, this thing's you know seventy percent uh, more transmissible. You know, a higher rate of transmissibility. So we're saying it's the Delta variants. You know, even more transmissible than Alpha, which was even more transmissible than the ones before it. So. Uh, and there's some other in early indications as well that the Delta variant could even evade some of the natural immunity that people get from having COVID before that wasn't from the Delta variant. So, you know, by that I mean people think, well, I had COVID before, I don't need to get vaccinated, I'm fine, I have natural immunity, you know, I, my body did it naturally, um, which is, <clears throat> can be true for some infectious diseases, it's not true for all of them. So what we can tell so far is that even if you had COVID before, if it wasn't the Delta variety, you could get reinfected and it could be with the Delta variant. So, um, so how much better are the vaccines at preventing it than if you had the infection? Well, the efficacy against symptomatic disease with Pfizer is about 88% effective and 96% effective against being hospitalized. Uh, Israel came out with their own, their Ministry of Health came out with a statement in the last week. Um, their calculation was about 64% effective at preventing symptomatic disease and 93% effective against severe disease and hospitalization. So pretty comparable to those first numbers. Those first numbers came out of the UK when they were looking at their, um, their Delta cases. So um, it's still very effective and arguably more effective than relying on natural immunity. We don't know for sure uh, about you know, Moderna's, but there's a lot of experts that think because they're both mRNA vaccines and very similar, it's probably on par with the Pfizer vaccine. And Janssen released some preliminary data as well looking at the Delta variant and it looks like it has a little bit better actually um, antibody activity than comparing it with beta or, or gamma. Um, I'm gonna pause here just for a second. Uh, I just wanna check to see if there are any questions because I can't see, so. Um, I, no, I there are not anymore. It was just the one about the flu. Okay, I'll keep pressing on then. Um, and of course I have to answer questions when it's done, but so. You know, again, we're building the case to say these vaccines work and they're the best thing we can do right now. Uh, but what are the risks of the vaccine? So that's uh, an important component. And I think that a lot of things that people are concerned about, in particular with Pfizer, is cases of myocarditis or pericarditis or these heart problems that came up after getting uh, the vaccine. So I'm going to go over that in this next section. So the common side effects are pretty similar to essentially any vaccine people get. It's, you know, pain maybe some redness or swelling at the injection site itself. And then sometimes people have system, systematic symptoms like tiredness, headache, fatigue, uh, fever, uh, but most people have tolerated it very well and gotten through it just fine with pretty minimal discomfort. But on rare occasions, there could be an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine, um, not really anything more than kind of baseline reactions, I would say to other you know, immunizations or vaccines either, but um, if there are people that had a, a history of severe um, allergic reactions to previous vaccines or other injectable medications, then we just watch them a little bit longer to make sure that they're okay. So usually if people have an anaphylactic reaction, it happens quickly. Um, so either you'd be watched for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on what kind of history you've had to, to um, previous injectable therapies or immunizations in the past. But again, by far and away, the majority of the population of the hundreds of millions of people who have gotten this vaccine have been fine. Okay, so onto the um, heart question of, you know, the myocarditis, pericarditis concern. So I just want to go over a little bit of background information about myocarditis and pericarditis in general before talking about the, the condition as it relates to the vaccine. So myocarditis is referring to inflammation of the heart muscle and pericarditis is referring to inflammation of the sac or the pericardium that surrounds the heart. So the heart kind of sits in a, in a sac that has a little bit of fluid in it, so it kind of can pump and not have friction. So that's essentially what it's referring to, is that inflammation of, of those two structures. It can be caused by a number of things. Um, I don't have an exhaustive list here. I just put some common things on there. So uh, infections, so it could be a viral infection, it could be with um, Coxsackie disease or Epstein-Barr virus, um, bacterial infection like strep, um, lupus, Kawasaki's disease, and actually just COVID-19 disease, not talking about the vaccine, but if you actually get COVID-19, which is a virus, the coronavirus, you can get myocarditis and pericarditis. And I'll talk about that in a couple of slides as well. How common is myocarditis in adolescents at baseline? This, this does happen up, even apart you know, from COVID-19 raising this concern, as I mentioned, with all these other causes. 
So in the 15 to 18 year old population, it's the rate's about 18 cases per million uh, kids. And that was looked at in the 2015, 2016 year. And the uh, predominance of that is usually in the male population. So 66, two thirds or 66% happen in, in boys uh, compared to girls. So again, looking at when this happens, this is the, um, these are the percent of, this is in kids, this is the percent of myocarditis cases that needed hospitalization. So you can see the in early on in life, newborns uh, will be ones will be hospitalized. And then you see this uh, peak in adolescence, 15, 16, 17, 18. So it, it happens anyway. Um, and it happens again, more in males versus females. So that's what this is essentially showing. So the dark, um, the dark bar is males and the light gray bar is females. And you can see all the way on the left, we're, these are going in five-year increments. So all the way on the left is 15, and then the next batch is 20 to 25. So you can just kind of see that adolescence, there's a higher rate, um, more, more boys and girls, and then it kind of trails off over time. There's another little blip around 50, 60, but you can kind of see this as something that happens anyway. Okay. Um, now what the CDC, does, CDC did was look at reports of myocarditis and pericarditis that were, that were reported into their adverse event reporting system after being vaccinated. And so the blue bars are when, what age it was reported in after the first dose. And the red bars are the ages that were, it was reported in after the second dose. So this is again, just the raw number of reports. This is in a percentage, but you can see again that most of the time it happened after the second dose. And it was again in kind of this younger population, um, 16 to 20, early 20s, let's say. So there's a little bit more of a predominance there. And then if it did happen, again, it happened with the second dose, but the symptoms usually occurred within the first four to five days after getting the, the vaccine. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. I, I put it up there for completeness, but in the next slide, I, I focus in on the 12 to 17 year old age group, but. <clears throat> What this was um, is showing is um, kind of the overall calculation of the number of cases that happen um, essentially per million kids after their second dose of vaccine um, or, or young people because this goes to into the 20s or over 30s. So um, this was just published by the CDC last week and this relates to the previous slide that kind of pulls on that information. So I just kind of blew, <clears throat> blew this up so you can see a little bit easier. And this is again, trying to look at the the benefits and the, the risks of having their COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, that was a Pfizer vaccine, essentially what we're talking about here. So this is again, 12 to 17 year olds, and you're looking at a million kids uh, after they got their second dose. So that's what that, the number per million vaccine dose administered is essentially looking at a million kids after they got their second dose. So their calculation essentially for, was broken down by males and females. But again, you know, there's a little bit of a difference between <clears throat> those two populations. But they calculated that if you vaccinated a million, you'd prevent 5,700 cases, prevent 215 hospitalizations, 71 ICU admissions, and two deaths in the male population. And you'd have um, somewhere between 56 and 69 cases of myocarditis in that, in that group. If you look at the young women, you'd prevent 8,500 cases, 183 hospitalizations, 38 ICU admissions, one death, and you'd have eight or 10 cases of myocarditis. And I think it's worth mentioning, let me see if I have it on the next slide. No, I, I think I have it in a, in a different slide, but I'll just mention it now. It's uh, worth mentioning that these cases of myocarditis that happened have been very um, kind of transient, mild cases that were quickly, um, you know, or I should say easily managed with basic medications, non-steroidal inflammatory medications. Um, and these kids had short hospital stay, stays and were out of the hospital in a couple of days. And that's very different from, you know, that's, that's essentially the, <clears throat> the immune system responding to the, the spike protein that it saw causing some inflammation of the heart muscle or the sac around the heart muscle, which is different from having COVID-19 and getting myocarditis or pericarditis where the actual virus is replicating and kind of, you know, ravaging these other systems of your body, you know, your heart and your lungs and your kidneys. Um, it's a little bit different when you're looking at the immune response of that compared to your body mounting immune response to the vaccine. But um, I'll touch on that in, in, in a minute again. So <clears throat> another study kind of looked at um, 
this is this is looking at athletes, collegiate athletes. So it's similar to adolescents if we're talking about high school or high school or high school athletes. But you know, these are you know people that are probably 18 to 22. They didn't report the exact age in this study, but they went around to uh, Big Ten universities and you know did these samples uh, of Big Ten athletes, and you know were doing surveillance testing. So they took over 9,200 athletes and tested them. 2,800 were positive, and then they wanted to put them through evaluation of their heart and see what happened to their heart just of having you know tested positive for COVID-19. What did that look like for them? So they went through the process and essentially the, they wanted to make sure that everybody that was included in the study had uh, an MRI of their heart to look for signs of inflammation um, on that imaging. So when you kind of bowl down the numbers and keep going down the line here, 37% were diagnosed with myocarditis, sorry, 37 or 2.3% were diagnosed with myocarditis. So that was some people had symptoms and some people didn't. So the people who had symptoms or not, there was nine, so it was about half of a percent. <clears throat> and 28 cases had what they considered subclinical myocarditis, but they had um, evidence of change from their laboratory tests, looking at troponins or an EKG, or again, looking at this MRI of the heart. <clears throat> so if I kind of take those uh, numbers and kind of stack them against what we were looking at before, I've added in the 18 to 24 age group because, you know, again, these were collegiate athletes. So I'm trying to give a little bit of a comparison, help, help break this down. And again, this is just kind of how I think through the numbers a little bit. If you were to take uh, a million of those, um, those collegiate athletes and say, okay, you're gonna have a, a million cases of um, COVID-19, a million cases of COVID-19 in a collegiate athlete, based on their numbers, you'd expect about 5,600 of them to have symptomatic myocarditis, meaning they have chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, you know, they, they can feel something's up, palpitations, they feel something's not right. Um, but if you're talking about, they feel fine, but they get an EKG or uh, do troponin levels, check their blood or do an MRI, you'll, there'd be 23,000 that would have evidence of heart damage. You look at, you know, a million of those collegiate athletes. So just trying to kind of compare, you know, the differences between those groups. It's, it's a little bit different than um, what I what I have presented here, because I'm talking about the number of cases prevented if you give a million doses to the um, 12 to 17 year olds, I'm comparing that to a million cases of people who actually got COVID. So again, this is comparing what happens if you get COVID and then what happens to your heart. So this um, study found essentially some mild myocardial dysfunction or mild heart dysfunction or the coronary arteries that surround the heart were changed about five and a half percent of cases. And they said, although the case fatality rate is known to be minimal in pediatric cases, the, this PMIS, that's the pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. That's that kind of MISC is the other name for it. It accounted for 12% of the COVID associated deaths among kids under 21 in the US between February um, and July, end of July in 2020, essentially. So that's again, different from if you get myocarditis or pericarditis from the vaccine. Again, it's, it's, you get NSAIDs, maybe some steroids, and you get discharged home in a few days, and generally you're, you do well. And I just took a snap of, snapshot of one of these reports, um, but it's kind of a similar theme if you look at the other studies and other case reports and case series that look at these um, cases of myocarditis and vaccination. So all that to say, you're far more likely to get myocarditis and pericarditis from COVID-19 infection and have a worse outcome from that than from the vaccine. And so there's, uh, I'm gonna give you some quotes here from this, this important statement at the end. The facts are clear, it's an extremely rare side effect and only an exceedingly small number of people experience it after vaccination. Importantly, for young people who do, most cases are mild and individuals recover often on their own or with minimal treatment. In addition, we know that myocarditis and pericarditis are much more common if you get COVID-19 and the risk to the heart from COVID-19 infection can be more severe. We recommend getting vaccinated right away if you haven't yet. It's the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, your community, and to return to a more normal lifestyle safely and quickly. And this, this was a joint statement between essentially every single medical professional in that society that's out there. So all the pediatricians, the academy of family practice, um, obstetricians and gynecologists, the hospital association, the medical association, the public health association. I mean, it, it's a pretty much across the board, like it, you're way better off to get vaccinated. We support it and you should do it right away. So that's, that's what the medical professionals think about. We did have one other question. Yeah. Um, 
that was asked a few slides back. It says, are there any deaths associated with COVID vaccine in adolescents who were otherwise healthy? That is, um, none that have been confirmed as of yet. There was one that made the news that I heard of last week in Detroit, Michigan, of a young boy, um, I don't remember if he was 12 or 13, that he, um, he passed away. Whether or not that was from the vaccine is not yet clear, that's being investigated. So that's not yet known, um, but it's a good question. But that's the only one that I've heard of, but again, that hasn't been, that hasn't been confirmed. It's still being investigated from the last I heard about it. So, um, you know, I think, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but again, we, you know, if I look at it from a population level, I have to look at how many hundreds of millions of vaccines have been given and how many cases are prevented and look at a population level and say, is this still better than that, that alternative? Um, so we'll have to see if that, um, if that case pans out or not. But I, I think even if it did, I would still say that the weight of the evidence is still very much on the side of the scale of recommending it. So if I, if I were to go back and kind of look at the 121 multi-system inflammatory syndrome cases in kids that I had mentioned earlier that happened between age zero and 19, 63% of those kids were in the ICU, 98% had cardiac disease. 93 had their GI system involved, 52% had neurologic symptoms, 45% had their respiratory system involved, and about a quarter had evidence of kidney damage. Um, and again, there were nine, nine pediatric deaths here in South Carolina. So that's when I, if I look at the number, so that's, these are the MISC numbers. If I look at the overall numbers, and again, I'm just kind of going, going back a little bit here to kind of pull it together. Um, 81,000 cases in 11 to 20 year olds. So if we had vaccinated all 81,000 of them, you know, this is all hypothetical because you can't, you can't go back. You don't know what would have happened. But if you're playing this game, if it's 90% effective vaccine, you would have prevented 73,000 73, infections in those 11 to 20 year olds. You have prevented about 600, 300, sorry, 360 symptomatic cases of myocarditis or carpet about that's again based on this half a percent that I was I had mentioned uh, earlier from this big study that was done at the Big Ten universities among athletes. But there'd be you know plenty of cases that um, didn't have symptoms, but if you put them on a, on a monitor and did an EKG or or, or scan their heart, you would have seen evidence of their heart being you know um, inflamed. So you know maybe a thousand cases that you would prevent it if you'd vaccinated them, and you, you might have prevented those nine deaths. Again, you know the efficacy. Uh, of the vaccine against preventing death is, you know, 95 to 100 percent is super effective, right? I mean, it's essentially about as good as you can get. So, if we had vaccinated all those um, people, maybe we would have prevented all those all those deaths. Um, and vaccines would have caused about maybe two or three cases of transient myocarditis in that population. So, we have 359,000 rising seventh to twelfth graders in South Carolina. So, you know, I don't know how many of them have had been vaccinated yet, been vaccinated or not yet, but I'm very concerned about what things are going to look like in the fall with, you know, essentially masks being removed um, and no other protective measures in place if people aren't getting vaccinated. That's really the only thing that they have to protect themselves. And I think getting vaccinated is going to keep, you know, your children safe, but it's also going to keep those who can't get vaccinated safe. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the idea of, of this herd immunity, and we don't have enough people vaccinated yet to reach that. So, you know, my first grader is still going to be susceptible, right? Because none of the elementary school kids can get it yet. Um, and I think this is my last slide. I, I did want to, you know, I did want to mention that the caveat to those prevention numbers, you know, has has some assumptions in there, but the Delta variant is more transmissible. Um, the viral load, uh, an article I was reading today, there was. Um, uh, a calculation looking at the viral load that's about a thousand times more than what we've had before, which makes sense when you look at its ability to outcompete the other variants, that it has a higher viral load earlier when they're checking people. So it, it's, 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 it transmits more easily, it replicates faster. So it's out, outpacing the other ones and spreads quickly. Um, and even places where people have been highly vaccinated, like places like Israel, where 90% of their adult population vaccinated are starting to see some outbreaks and see outbreaks in, um, in kids and in schools. So the more cases you have in kids in, in, a, in a virus that transmits faster, replicates faster, it's just going to lead to more, you know, more cases of, of kids, more hospitalizations, more ICU admissions, and, and deaths. I don't know how many more, but that's my concern. So that's um, all I wanted. That's all I have prepared slide-wise, but I'm happy to 
answer any other questions as they come up. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. So we can turn this over to um, Dawn. Dawn, I think you were gonna go over any, um, any additional questions that maybe had not been uh, answered before. Yes. So I'll, I'll read the question and then I'll respond. Most of the questions that were submitted ahead of time were answered in Dr. Kanaka's um, wonderful presentation. Um, but the first question was, why are masks not required when all students may not be vaccinated? Um, school uh, masks are still currently recommended in school buildings. We just can no longer require them due to the recently passed provisio by the state legislation. It was 1.108 in the state budget. Um, now, federal guidelines still require them on school bus, on buses, in, but as of last week, uh, the State Department of Education um, looked at the provisio put out by the state legislature saying that we cannot require masks and school buses are an extension of school property. Therefore, we still recommend that your child wear a mask when on the bus and when at school, except when they're eating or other, other times throughout the day. We just can't require them anymore. Um, and as you heard, how wonderfully low our flu numbers were this year, we know that simple masking and social distancing and hand washing works. Um, so it's something we really need to continue as we return to school. I urge you to really consider having your child still mask uh, because we're all concerned about this Delta variant and how transmissible it is. Um, the second question was, do all students have to be vaccinated to attend school? No, there's no COVID vaccine requirement to attend school. Um, who decided which vaccine to administer to children 12 and older? Currently, Pfizer has the only vaccine that is permissible to give to ages 12 to 17. So Moderna and Janssen, we could not go with because it hasn't been approved for those age groups. If my child is vaccinated and exposed to COVID-19, do they still need to quarantine? Um, based on our last DHEC guidelines, vaccinated employees and students do not have to quarantine if they're exposed, as long as we can see your date that you are fully vaccinated, meaning it's been two weeks since your second dose of vaccine. Um, we're still waiting for updated guidance from DHEC for if there will be any changes for in the school. But if you can prove that your child has been vaccinated or you as an employee is vaccinated, you do not quarantine. However, you still need to symptom monitor. And if you start developing symptoms, you need to go get tested. And if you're positive, we will put you into isolation, just like anyone else that tests positive for COVID-19. Um, and we've already covered the different side effects. Um, does the vaccine cause illness? Um, there's no live virus component in any of the vaccines. So they're not going to cause you to get COVID-19. Just like when you get the flu shot, unless you've gotten the live intranasal, um, you're not going to, it's not, the vaccines are not going to cause you to get COVID-19 or influenza. And I Don, think we did have a clarifying question about the masks. Uh huh. Uh, it looks like it's a maybe a two part. It says, "Will kids who have been vaccinated not have to wear masks?" And then, so I think this happened as you were explaining. So, kids who are vaccinated or not can choose whether to wear masks. Right now, we can't require masks, so parents and students can choose whether they want to wear a mask. Um, however, it is still highly recommended that everyone continue to mask. That's the only way we're going to keep from spreading COVID-19 when we put everyone back in the classroom, um, full space. Um, some of the new CDC guidelines that have come out this week 
um, encourage us to still mask as we have been doing, um, recommending schools be open full face to face in all classrooms, all school districts, and um, social distancing still, if you can get greater than three feet, those are the recommendations. Do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Kanaka? Or Vicki okay. Ladd? I, I would I add to that just, just a reminder that that is, um, that is all because of the state legislatures. Uh, I mean, it's a law now that we can't require um, masks. Uh, yeah. they, the, there was more says, will there be an option for children to attend school from school? I think that might mean school from home. The only school from home option is the virtual school. Um, uh, yeah, she said, I meant from home. That's what I thought. That is the virtual school. Um, looks like there was another follow-up question about kids with in sports. And kids in sports do not have to wear masks either. Correct. 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 But then if we end up with a COVID case in an athletic team, we're still going to do our contact tracing. None of that is changing. So we're still going to look at close contacts and close contacts are going to have to be quarantined. But if your child is a student athlete that has been vaccinated, they would not have to quarantine if they were exposed to a teammate that's positive. And then we have a question. I'm a little concerned with the possibility of side effects since the second shot is being provided just before the first day of school. Should I be concerned? So that's Saturday the 14th is the second shot and then the 18th is the first day of school. So should there be concern about side effects still going on four days later? I'm, I'm happy to take a step of that. I would say no, definitely not. Um, I, I would get the vaccine as, as quickly as you can. And even if you get your second dose, it takes um, two weeks after that second dose for your body to build up its full immunity. So, you know, let's say your kid gets their um, second dose on the 14th, it would be, you know, the 28th of August, essentially, before we'd say they're considered, you know, fully, fully protected. Um, so I, I think, you know, the sooner you get the vaccine, the better. Um, the, the symptoms generally do, most of the symptoms generally resolve within the first couple of days anyway. So we're kind of talking about the pain at the ejection site, tiredness, fatigue, that usually lasts for a couple of days, one, two, three days, kind of is very typical, but not beyond that. So if you're talking about the 14th, if school starts the 18th, I would expect the majority, the vast majority of any kind of symptoms and people would be um, gone by then. And, and I would interject here that even though the district is offering these uh, uh, clinics, by all means, if you would rather go ahead and get your children vaccinated even before uh, July 24th and then the 14th. Um, I'm sure there are many, I know you can find many other, uh, if, if you do wanna make sure that it's been a full two weeks before they go to school, um, then certainly uh, we understand that and, and would, that's great with us too. We're trying to offer this as a service, uh, but you're not limited to doing it just with the school district. Yeah, and we have about 260 signed up so far, so we're doing good. All right, any other questions? I might, and I might answer one that um, I get that I think people want to know is about kids that are um, under 12. When can they get their other, when might that be coming out? I don't, I don't have any personal contact with Pfizer or the FDA, so I don't know definitively, but I do know that their, their representatives have said that they're planning to review their data in September and submit it to the FDA for a review in September. I don't know exactly when that would happen and how long it would take the FDA to review it um, and make sure that they feel that it's safe to um, give to kids under 12, but their next batch is kind of a five to 11 or five to 12 year old group. Um, and I know that they're also doing, um, I think it's two to five, they kind of broke it down, but they're gonna kind of come I think in quick succession, but. Um, that, that elementary age group probably won't be able to get vaccinated until maybe October if everything kind of goes as is being stated by, by the by Pfizer representatives. All right. I don't see any other questions. 
Um, just a reminder, if you have not yet signed up and after this call you've decided you want to, you still can do that with the link that was sent from Libby Roof. Uh, I believe this Friday is the uh, cutoff for signing up for the vaccines. Um, we do, wait, we do have one more question. Will students have a virtual option if there is a big outbreak in school? Um, we are actually meeting this week to discuss what school's gonna look like uh, next year. We know that right now, we're not going to have dual modality. So we will not have students face-to-face -face and virtual at the same time. Um, that might be something we would look at if we had to quarantine an entire classroom and the teacher. We still want education to continue while people are in quarantine. So that is something we will be looking at this week, what, what it's gonna look like another school year. And we have to um, come up with our plans and present them to the public. Um, and it has to be turned into the State Department sometime later this month, what our plan's going to look like. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And just like we did last year, um, all of that will be communicated to you multiple times in multiple ways uh, as we determine what that is. All right. Well, we appreciate you all. Thank you so much to Dawn and Dr. Kanaka and all of our folks from DHEC and Prisma. We certainly appreciate your partnership in this as we uh, try to step forward. We're getting some thank you comments. So thank you from those who are on the call as well. Um, but we will just look forward to uh, a much uh, better uh, next year than we've had this year. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good evening. evening. Bye. Bye.